Now, what are the characteristics of resilience? This is a subject that's been studied in recent years by a number of ecologists quite, quite exhaustively. Resilience is, is a pretty robust idea in the literature at this point. It means redundancy in critical systems. It means dispersed system control points, dispersed inventories, and building balancing feedback loops into all of our critical social systems. Interestingly enough, resilience is often very much at odds with a, tr a goal that we've been pursuing over the past few decades, which is economic efficiency. Economic efficiency would say, if we can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than anywhere else, then we'll grow all our corn in Iowa, and we won't grow anything in Iowa except corn. That's economically efficient, but it creates a very brittle system, because if anything undermines that corn crop, we have nothing else to fall back on. So resilience means looking at ec economic efficiency and saying, yes, that's fine, but there's another priority that's just as important. And we need to build that resilience into our, again, into our food systems, our economic system, our energy system, and so on. Building resilient communities is going to be a process that, again, will have to come from both the top down and from the bottom up. And I'd like to talk about some of those bottom up efforts that I see already going on. Uh, throughout North America and around the world. That's where I really see hope. I, I know that I've been saying some, as, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I promised you I'd say some challenging things. Uh, and s some of this, I'm sure, is not very welcome to hear. But when we look at what communities are doing and, and community groups are doing voluntarily to deal with climate change, with fossil fuel, dependency and so on, there are some really amazingly ingenious projects already underway. And if uh, government planners can take note of these efforts and start to institutionalize them and support them, then we can actually get where we're going, I think, much more rapidly. One example is an organization called Co-op Power in Massachusetts, which has taken as its goal the development of renewable energy specifically in low-income communities by creating a, a novel cooperative investment program. And you can find out much more at their website than I can tell you right now, and that'll be the case with, with many of these. I'd like to explain them further, but time is limited. Looking at transportation, we desperately need more public transportation, but it's expensive to build public transport infrastructure. If oil is going to be more expensive, gasoline, diesel fuel are going to be more expensive, a lot of people simply aren't going to be able to afford to operate private automobiles. So we need streetcars and light rail for them, but do we have the several billion dollars it might take in each community to build light rail systems? Perhaps not over the short term, at least. So we're going to have to look at how we can use existing road vehicles much more efficiently, find incentives to put more people in each vehicle so that we don't see a three-ton SUV driving down the road with a driver and no passengers. Increasingly, vehicles are filled with passengers. You know, that's the fastest, easiest, most effective, cheapest way to increase the energy efficiency of transportation is simply put more people in existing vehicles. I was visiting Montana recently and met with some people who were, had created this amazing venture called Mission Mountain Enterprise Foods Center. Uh, it's in a little town called Ronan, Montana. Montana is a state that is a, a big food exporting region. They export wheat and beef. And uh, Almost none of what they produce stays within the state. If you buy a McDonald's hamburger in Helena, Montana, the wheat may have been grown in Montana, the beef may have originally come from Montana, but those things would have been taken out of state for processing before they were re-imported back into Montana. So it's, it's kind of a, a metaphor or microcosm for, for our whole globalized economy. Well, some folks in Ronan were small food producers, backyard gardeners and, and small farmers, and they realized they were up against globalization. They couldn't, they couldn't compete with the scale of their production, but they wanted a local food system, so they realized that the missing link was a commercial kitchen that could be shared cooperatively that would enable them to produce value-added products 
everything from soups. They can not only can the soup in an industrial, food grade, you know, uh, authorized kitchen, but also uh, uh, label it and, and store it. Uh, even things like uh, herbal tea, they have a tea bagging machine so that, so that local growers who grow uh, herbs are able to produce value-added products and make a decent living producing herbal teas. This, I think, is the missing link in local food systems. And there's a lot of interest now in increasing uh, uh, diversity and resilience of local food systems, but to a very large extent, I think we're overlooking these, these missing links, such as these folks identified. In Manhattan, there's Sixth Street, Sixth Street Community Center. Manhattan, of course, is a very, very dense urban area, and yet there are places where there is not cement and there are not buildings, and Sixth Street Community Center identifies those places and, build, and puts in gardens and gets people tending those gardens and sharing out the produce so that there's not a, there's not a single open centimeter in Manhattan <laughs> that's not being used uh, to support people there. Organized squatting is a concept that, that is starting to, to get off the ground in, in some of the cities that have been more hard hit initially by the economic recession. I think we'll, we'll see the need for it increasingly in many other places. People are always need shelter as real estate prices crash, as there are more vacant buildings, we're going to see the need to match people up with vacant structures and do that in a way that supports the community. It's in no one's interest to have people homeless or hungry. So even though our economy it may be in dire straits, we have to make sure that everyone is taken care of. Community currencies are an idea that's taking off in many places around the world. There are over 2,500 local cur currencies. Now, usually, they're hard to get started, and they don't really amount to much because you can't pay your mortgage, you can't uh, uh, pay off your bank loans, you can't pay taxes with uh, community currencies. You usually you know, pay somebody to mow your lawn or for a massage or something like that, non-essentials. But historically, and the history of community currencies goes back many decades. Historically, where national currencies have become problematic for one reason or another, whether because of deflation or inflation, community currencies have been a stopgap measure to help communities uh, match up producers with consumers. So having a healthy community currency is like having an insurance policy. The last of these uh, instances I want to talk about is the transition towns. These are initiatives that have started in the UK. There are now dozens of them all over the planet. And the idea behind the transition towns is that we are going to a fossil fuel free economy one way or the other. So why not get there the best way we can by assuming that life can be better without fossil fuels? It's an, an entirely bottom up self organizing model and um, the Transition Handbook by my friend Rob Hopkins is an excellent resource to understanding what the, the transition process is all about. It's something that, that can be started in, in any size community uh, or in, in, in individual neighborhoods. In this process, I think it's important for policymakers, of course, to put the best face on things. Obviously, we can't tell all and sundry that the future is one of economic contraction and uh, all of the, that that entails and uh, we just have to grit our, grit our teeth and bear it. It's important to point out the very real benefits that are going to come with a shift away from fossil fuels over the long run. We could enjoy much more of what we had to give up in order to get where we are today. Much more personal autonomy, a sense of community, uh, intergenerational solidarity, free time. You know, there's no correlation between happiness and energy consumption. Beyond, as long as people have enough energy to cook their food, keep their homes warm, beyond that, there's no correlation whatsoever. And even in what we would think of as very poor countries, people are often just as happy or happier than in countries where energy consumption is as high as or even higher than that of North America.